NDTV and you're watching NDTV Prime. Universities and colleges add millions of graduates to the existing workforce every year. But unfortunately, very few are found fit by industry to hire. The problem, of course, is not limited to a particular field of study or industrial sector. It is perhaps systemic. It applies as much to medicine as it does to engineering and management studies. But today on the show, we will limit the discussion to management studies. And to set the agenda for the discussion, I want to mention a few key findings of an SOCHAM report released late last year. The report goes on to say only 7% of those graduating are actually employable. Barring those who graduate from top management colleges like the IAMs, FMS, etc., most end up earning less than rupees 10,000 a month. That is, if at all, they find placements. Hello and welcome, you're watching Heads Up. To discuss how we can prepare India's young to lead in the global environment, I'm joined by a very special panel. On my left, I have Dr. Shubhra Sain, Director of School of Extended Education and Professional Development and School of Management and Entrepreneurship, Shivnada University. Thanks for joining us, sir. I also have with me uh, Mr. Nishat Arora, Chairman, MPS Limited, Sir R. Anand, Senior Vice President, HR at ACL Technologies, and Mr. Rohan Kapoor, Director, Deloitte India. Dr. Sain, I want to start with you because it all starts in schools, colleges. It all starts with academia. So there is a problem and there are reports, you know, uh, on it, not one or two, but multiple reports. If you were to sort of, you know, talk about a few key areas, a few key problem areas, what would they be? In management education, I think it really stems from a lack of qualified faculty. And that's, you know, so as you go towards the base of the pyramid, I think the talent at that level really thins out rapidly and that consequently does have, you know, uh, an impact on the level of training and education the students get from such institutions. So I think it's really the problem of large numbers. I think we're a bimodal system. Our top that's not something you can do much about. I mean, our large numbers are something. as good, yeah. Right. Right. So large numbers, of course, I mean, I mean, we have to deal with the fact that India has the largest population of, you know, people under 35. I mean, it's a big number that we have to deal with. Uh, but that said, that aside, Mr. Kapoor, from the policy side, if you look at the curriculum, it's largely been insular. Things around have been changing. The job scenarios, the kind of jobs which are out there are also changing. But curriculum largely has remained the same. Yeah. Why? Why? Why is that the case? I think the regulators have not been keen enough to change the, uh, the curriculum with the changing times and that has had an impact on the total uh, management education sector in the country. Uh, our national policy on education you know, has been in the works for the last three years. So if the policy is taking so much of time, we can just imagine the curriculum refreshment can take so much longer. So uh, I think uh, the curriculum has to be updated first of all. Secondly, we have to start focusing on getting the global best practices integrated in the management system. And thirdly, our education institutions and management institutions do not focus on research. Yes, research is extremely important in management education. As we move along the ladder, as we move along the technologies, the education and in management research are going to become very, very important. And right. our education institutions have to start focusing on management research. And we're not doing enough when it comes to research. Absolutely. Mr. Arora, based on your journey as an entrepreneur, when you look at the West, I mean, the Amazons and the Ubers are coming out of those kind of technological innovations are happening there. Uh, and graduates from Harvard, Stanford and other such top colleges are the ones who are coming up with such kind of innovations. Why can't we do it? And why can't we run uh, businesses as successful as those? Well, if I look at my own journey, I started off, I mean, I had the best of education in yes. Stephens and I am in the bar and then, you know, you worked, on various Harvard, company, yes. worked on various, com various companies and, and mid-30s, I decided to become an entrepreneur. Yeah. And I used to have deep conversations with my, one of my last bosses at that time who was an entrepreneur and he said that the single reason why you're not an entrepreneur already is because of your education because it sort of reduces your risk-taking ability the because blinder, you, you, you right. analyze you analyze too much 
You know, right. so so that's I'm just putting it in perspective. Right. And if you look at, and I can relate to this even today because if you look at some of these success stories which you just mentioned, many of these guys are college you know, dropouts. College dropouts. Dr. Sen, do you agree with that point of view? I mean, when it comes to entrepreneurship, it is not something that we are encouraging in universities and colleges. I I do believe that there may have been a case in the past where people were in a sense self-selecting. Uh, I I became a serial entrepreneur. Nishit and I, in fact, uh, have the same background. We studied economics. I studied international politics. Then I did a PhD in business. Right. You know, there was no natural path that was emerging towards entrepreneurship. But uh, some inner drive takes you. So I think earlier that was the case. So we're formally committed to entrepreneurship, and we're doing a great deal to facilitate that. And it's not just direct interaction with the students you have to create an ecosystem that supports creativity supports self expression to talk about the ecosystem we have more than 5500 you know business colleges in this country there are many other colleges who also have incubator cells and uh, you know are doing various things to promote entrepreneurship uh, but do you think we are doing as 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 a country you know and in terms of policy i'll get mr kapoor uh, on that you know later on um, are doing enough to promote it perhaps across the board i think we've we've been making noises about it for a while now right. there's a real move towards it while there are many incubators to give you an example the sn the shivnada university incubator it's it's a partnership with the government the government is contributing funds as well so it's a step up in it's the game up. in that sense and many universities today are now formally doing things to actively encourage real experiential learning and then there's also linkages that you can build into the curriculum so while the students are doing projects can they actually develop a distinctive expertise in an area that will be potentially useful for them in their careers and so those linkages which were earlier left to chance are right. now being more formally built into the curriculum so i believe it's a dynamic space right industry academia gap uh something which we can reach in the near future sure i think steps need to be taken from both the sides you know uh, industry needs to realize that they have a high stake involved in the academia and they need to take the proactive steps towards working with the academia to ensure that the courses and the skilling opportunities which are being provided are as per the industry standards so that the ultimate goal of kids who go to a higher education institution in india management graduates is actually jobs right very very few opt for entrepreneurship so if jobs is the criteria then industry has to be involved right so that is where i feel that industry also has to realize it has a very big stake in it and actually come forward work with the government and ensure that the kids that are being prepared are, are industry ready right mr anand and this is the moment that i was waiting for in the discussion before i can sort of you know ask you a question so industry uh, according to uh, mr kapoor here is uh required to work in tandem with university with educational institutions uh, your view on that now 100% uh, agree with that i think uh, industry does need to work but you know if you peel the onion and say how should industry work with academia because the devil is in the details i think you will come to the thing that you should actually have some metrics to measure so how many uh, management school faculty today uh, consult and get paid for it in the industry suppose you had a metric and said that you know naturally they will be able to bring the context of the industry to the classroom secondly i think you know the regards to the earlier discussion right why does somebody go to iim to get a safe job and settle into their career but what do we want them to do we want them to take risk and found companies right so there is a mismatch of motivation that is there i think the mba preparation industry is perhaps larger than the mba industry right if you take mba as a school so and and what about this entire i mean this is something uh, which i have noticed and especially recently i mean uh, students will go to iits then after that they will go to iims and then perhaps they will sit in for upsc and uh, which i mean i mean as long as it is something which the student wanted to do it's absolutely fine it's not because of lack of opportunities is it so a uh, couple of things one i think the uh, level of career counseling that we do in india so initially you know your parents pretty much decide on the ecosystem decides what is right to aspire for right right i think that is the reason why people are reinventing themselves and saying this is not me but this is me and therefore some part is you know getting done the diversion yeah from a premier educational institution into engineering then to management then to administration is happening to some extent i think it is also a lack of opportunities because of the volume of people that pass out from india i think there is a there is a danger that we will be underemployed not perhaps even unemployed but underemployed right i think it is because of that reason also they are doing both reasons are there right one i think the degree of career counseling has to be stronger 
Yeah. You need to tell people that it's okay to aspire for what you aspire for. I think that is, uh, you know, a big part to blame in that. You must have uh, interviewed, you know, a countless number of these graduates, you know, uh, who come to you looking for jobs. What, according to you, because we have heard from, you know, Dr. Sain here, he represents academia. We have also heard from Mr. Kapoor and then Mr. Aurora. Uh, what, according to you, are the problem here? As what is lacking? So, uh, I think, you know, if you look at the world of academia, right, it is this it is structured to be very predictable, right? There are exams at a particular time. You know how you will get grades and so on. But the world of work is inherently unpredictable, right? And you know you are not paid to learn, right? You are paid to actually add value to the business. Therefore, there are two things that uh, usually get missed and that we look for: the ability to you know add value in an ambiguous environment is one of the key things I look for. Explain that ambiguous environment. So, for example, the problem is not well defined in industry, right? right. And often uh, effort gets wasted in solving the wrong problem. Whereas the problem is well defined in academia. The question is very clear. You have to just find the answer. Right. In the industry, you have to find the question first, right? The right question first. Right. I think the ability to navigate ambiguity, the ability to tolerate the frustration of ambiguity and still make progress. Right. I think that's one of the things that I look for. Okay. That is often the place where good students don't make the cut. Right. right? I think therefore the, the correlation between the so-called grades and the world of work, you know, uh, sort of uh, breaks down there. The second thing is in the world of education, right, people move with their peers. Everybody is in their age group, they relate to that. But in the world of work, they have to relate to a very diverse spectrum of people. Right. So their savviness quotient is something that I check for by asking questions like, you know, have you persuaded somebody to do something? Right. Have you gotten together with a diverse set of people to attempt something? Do you think that could be solved? And I want to address this to uh, Dr. Sain here. Do you think the kind of issues that uh, Mr. Anand just mentioned, can they perhaps be solved by multidisciplinary education, you know, giving an economic student the option of sort of, you know, perhaps even sort of, you know, taking up a course in technology, uh, you know, if he eventually wants to work uh, with, you know, uh, a company like HCL later on? Yes, I mean, I agree 100 percent with what Anand said. And right. also exactly as you're saying, yes, there is a lot that can be done. And schools are doing that increasingly. I mean, again, to use the example at Shivnada, where we are multidisciplinary by design. So by definition, the students have a common core curriculum that they have to take before they go into their specialization. So we feel that broadens their background. But more importantly, the kind of assignments they get, the kind of opportunities they get to select projects, to think for themselves, to right. fail, to actually understand how, you know, assumptions can lead to, you know, very dramatically different results from what was assumed in a stable environment. All that uncertainty and unpredictability needs to be built into their thinking process. Like Dr. Sain said, students while they're in universities and college should be given the opportunity to fail. You've been an entrepreneur. You have walked that path. Take us through that. Tell us how important it is for a student to have the opportunity to fail in a safe environment, which is while he is in university and college. Because out in the world, it means something very different. And I'm sure Mr. Anand agree with me on that. I mean, you know, so uh, I, I, I want to uh, have you come in here and tell us about that. Yeah, I think uh, failure is, uh, is very much a part of life. I think uh, if I look back at my entrepreneur, uh, entrepreneur journey, I think my first project when I decided to become an entrepreneur was to make a etchant for removing, you know, uh, copper from uh, while producing printed circuit boards. It was a bizarre project. And um, I still remember the fumes from all the ammonia. And it was a flop. I mean, the damn thing wouldn't work. And, you know, and then I tried after that to become a distributor for semiconductors. And it was, it was bizarre. For two, three years, I used to, you know, be like this. And, uh, and then along came one good idea, and that, that worked. And then I was able to build on that. Right. And, but similarly, within, even when you're the idea came from the failure itself, right? Yeah, the, it, the failure sort of strengthens you. You know, right. it, sort of, it sort of closes one door and forces you to go... Yeah. elsewhere yeah. right so if I look at my success it's because of the wonderful people I've been able to work with yeah. you, you pick up somebody who's just a plain vanilla graduate from the most you know D college possible and we you know, the, the guys have just performed in yeah. you know they've in our company has been built on people who who, who have sort of worked non-stop for not gone home for yeah. three or four days or five days yeah. and achieved miracles which which are admired by customers and which helped us us grow so I think coming here, I mean, you know, 
um, I'm sorry I'm interrupting you, but I want Mr. Anand to come here because he's the one at the end of the day who's sitting across the table from a student and, you know, asking him the kind of questions which decide whether he will sort of, you know, make the cut at a particular company or not. Uh, uh, so I want to talk to uh, I want you to talk to us about, uh, you know, the kind of journeys that, uh, you know, uh, both Dr. Sen, you know, and uh, Mr. Aurora talked about here. When you look at a student, you know, someone who's jumped ships, you know, has been to different places and has also failed, uh, something he might not want to put on his resume. But when you're talking to these students, uh, do you consciously, you know, ask them about their failures perhaps and what they have learned from it? Do you look for that kind of a candidate? Is it a bad thing to have failed in the past? Not at all. So, in fact, uh, to tell you, at HCL, we ran a, uh, the grandest failure contest where people had to apply for it and uh, they had to say what was the bold idea they tried and it, they must have failed and they must explain what they learned from it. And it was sponsored right by the chairman himself. Right. So, we, we really think only by that failure and that personal involvement and you know, you cry, you get over it, you will really get a very different learning and a reinvention of yourself. Yeah. But so the crying bit is important. Yeah, and absolutely. also getting over absolutely, it. Absolutely. Absolutely. That's very important because that is what makes you. And I think uh, uh, when I talk to people, so for example, if somebody has not got good grades in a particular semester, I ask them and we look for that sincerity and authenticity, right? If you cheat yourself and you cheat others, it's no, it's no good. If you say, okay, so somebody said I played football, I wasted my time, I realized it and I got over it and here is what it is. Yeah. I think that's perfectly fine. I think it is very important uh, to look for failure, to acknowledge failure, to have learned from failure and to have that self-acceptance. I think it's extremely important uh, to have that and I definitely look for that. I know my fellow recruiters also look for it, that right. authenticity. Right. So failure is just pick up on that piece. one piece, uh, something both Nishit and Mr. Anand both said, we can spark their curiosity. You know, it's often intimidating. We tell people, you must follow your passion, you must follow your passion. Firstly, it's hard to figure out what your passion is. Yeah. It's intimidating actually to figure out what your passion is. But you can always follow your curiosity yeah. and you can follow your curiosity. Like Mr. Aurora said, I mean, yeah. he doesn't know what he wants to do a year later, forget the entire and, lifetime. And so that's something that institutions can do, right. you know, because it's a dynamic environment, students are always, you know, sparkling with ideas, solutions to problems. So there is room and need for innovation. Right. Mr. Kapoor. So, so what I was saying was most of the, you know, the, the biggest corporates in the world are actually being run, the CEOs are Indians. You, know, you could talk about Google, Pepsi, right. and some of those have actually studied in India and then moved on to their uh, higher studies overseas. So there is nothing wrong, it need, just hasn't uh, evolved, you know, and, and the government has in the last few years, uh, took a lot of focus, increased a lot of focus on in evolving the curriculum. Uh, on the innovation aspect, we have Atal Innovation Mission. Right. So the government is funding labs in schools for students to innovate. They can fail very happily, but they are getting funds from the government. So innovation has, uh, the focus has increased. From a policy side, I think the government has started giving funds. They have realized that the employment opportunities in India are decreasing. Services is not growing at that rate, it was growing earlier and we have to have new companies, new organizations to come in to generate employment opportunities. Right. And that is why I think the Startup India mission is very, very important. And now I want to talk to, I mean, last few minutes of the discussion. So I uh, want to focus on Mr. Anand and, and Dr. Sain here because we really want to sort of, you know, figure out what is perhaps the missing link between uh, what is being taught in universities and colleges and what industry requires. So when it, uh, when it comes to collaboration, the kind of collaboration which is perhaps required uh, to sort of, you know, uh, eventually uh, be, uh, be in a place where you have the kind of graduates which the industry wants and which the academia can also prepare. You have already spoken about what's missing, what's perhaps lacking, but how can industry and academia collaborate? So I think uh, we need to have a structure, you know, where we can utilize the time of industry because time of uh, people in the industry is not available. They are busy by per se. Right. Suppose you get half an hour of that time, what do you want to do? Suppose you get half a day of that time, what do you want to do? Suppose you get one week of that time, what do you want to do? I think creating a very robust program structure whereby somebody who is there, you know that you know this person can give this to my students and this much time he or she has and how do we make use of it. I think that program structure has to evolve. Lot of you know digital platforms and technologies can be used to evolve that program structure where like you book a room or book something, book a cab, you can book a faculty 
why not and yeah. i think if you start innovating like that and try to bring that program and stitch the whole thing into an orchestra it can very well be done a curriculum design is not a big problem you know there are some missing pieces which can get added very easily right awareness is very high internet is there everybody knows what is going on in the latest this thing but there is a curriculum transaction how that design is taught you know how it comes live in the classroom i think there some more work need to be done that's why technology can perhaps also play a role i mean there's no question technology has been a game changer at right. two key levels one is really the pervasive availability of really high quality content right. from some of the world's best institutions some of the world's best thinkers increasingly available anywhere and almost for free if right. not for free so that is a huge i think step where the you know the rising tide will raise all ships at right. least those who are keen and certainly the universities that are interested in developing themselves into global institutions are taking that automatically the other side where technology has changed business is the playing field itself has been altered so apropos what anand was saying we have to really look at the outcome there's absolutely nothing preventing a school we have a corporate mba program where we work with the leaders of the corporation saying what will the students do in the first 6 to 9 months right. and then we and look at our curriculum you. design to see can we backward integrate can we build in those can we get that half an hour of their time yeah. but make that half an hour pointed and useful right. so the idea of technology and conversations and better coordination between the stakeholders is where the opportunities lie structure with its contours and and it's eminently feasible that is what is what is, you know that it's not like it's a problem that cannot be addressed because both the academia and its industry have the same goals yeah. and so if we mesh our outcomes and intertwine the training the outcomes should be very good right i will give the last word to you mr arora and because uh, more than job seekers perhaps what this country need at this point in time is you know job creators and you've been one and uh, is entrepreneurship something that could be taught at universities and colleges or is it something is it perhaps you know uh, the metaphorical gene that one just has or doesn't yeah i think uh, as i mentioned earlier in the past it may have been the gene factor right but i think in today's more complex world it's uh, education can do a do a lot in fact there are more and more you know i've been to i am amdabad i'm associated with their entrepreneur program i go to harvard business school and there's a lot more being done today at the business schools to encourage entrepreneurship yes. and this is a big change incidentally from what uh, what was the case maybe 15 20 years ago 15 20 years ago i remember being in a forum at i am amdabad yeah on entrepreneurship and one guy in the audience who later i found was a student's father said am i getting this right are you teaching these youngsters to go into business you know for you don't need this fancy mba degree from i am amdabad to right. uh, you know to start a business yeah. for god's sake don't mislead these children right you know so so as a sea change from that time to to now so i think uh, you know the, the 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 setup is very good and uh, more and more people will come forward to become entrepreneurs and as has been mentioned that's the you know the need uh, india needs that right so it isn't a problem that could just be wished away what's required as pointed out by the panelists on the show is a long term vision and a clear cut strategy to achieve the goals on that note we will wrap up today's discussion thanks for joining us until next time goodbye and thanks for watching